Welcome to the University of Chicago UN campus. I'm Mark Arnico. I'm the executive director of the campus here. And uh, I'll give you a few notes before we get started into introductions and telling you more about the program. As always, uh, we're sharing the event tonight on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube uh, from the Chicago UN campus here in Hong Kong. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you're on the online audience, uh, please register on Zoom and you can submit those questions to our team and the speakers uh, via Zoom. Uh, just as a reminder for all of you who may not know about our uh, UN Campus uh, website and our e-news, uh, you can subscribe to e-news on the website at www.uchicago.hk uh, and you can get the latest uh, information and updates about our programming. So I'm really excited tonight about the opening of our exhibition, which many of you in the room have already seen, uh, Daughters of Canton Delta. Uh, this is an exhibition talk on Zishunyu, or self combed women. And the exhibition is curated by Arts for Good Foundation founder Amanda Sun, uh, with artworks from Kurt Tong and Chen Jialu. And they're all with us tonight. The uh, Kurt Tong's personal objects explore his Chinese roots and understanding of his motherland. He's published the book, The Queen, The Chairman, and I, a multi-layered narrative, that book that explores his family stories and greater political world. His other photographic projects and books have won numerous awards, including the Prix Elysee, the WMA, the Punctum Award at Lienjo Photo, the Asia Reference Photo Award, and the Photo Folio Award at Recomte Bows. Uh, his book, Dear Franklin, was also named as one of the top 10 photo books of 2022 by MoMA in New York. Congratulations on that, by the way. Kurt earned his master's in documentary photography at London College of Communication. And um, in his exhibition, for those of you that have come to campus, we have pieces. River Basin uh, in the early 1900s with her project Upo, exploring and documenting the ruins of Combs sisters' houses and creating works in different media to provide unique narratives and experiences exploring autonomy, the connection between people and the land, and how to tell a story. She's published her own artist books, Cold Hearted and Seemingly Harmless. She's earned her bachelor's degree in fine arts from Chelsea College, University of the Arts in London, and was awarded a research grant by HB Station of Contemporary Art Research Center, Guangzhou, from 2016 to 2017. In this exhibition here on campus, we have pieces from uh, Jia Lu's research on the group of Combs Sisters, also known as Gu Po, and Combs Sisters' houses focusing on the memories and routes of the movement of the Combs sisters from the Xijiang River Basin um, throughout Southeast Asia. The curator of the exhibition is Amanda Sun. She's the founder, as I said, of the Arts for Good Foundation. Amanda and I met, she's one of our alums. We met about a year ago. I could see that Amanda had a passion for the arts, and so we kept a dialogue going about various projects, and when she presented this project to me, I was like, that's it, let's do that. And so we've been working for the last several months with Kurt and to make this exhibition happen. So I wanted to have uh, Amanda talk about what inspired her to bring this uh, exhibition to the campus. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, everybody, for making your way here. I, I really appreciate that. Um, we're all here tonight for stories. Um, stories uh, with context, perspective, and history. And I do believe that this is what um, Arts for Good is about. We are advocating that diversity and inclusion through the power of stories. Um, and we hope that we connect with our audiences emotionally and also really to reflect um, different perspectives of the different, the, this woman's life experiences, the legacy the woman bring it to Hong Kong, 
and also um, a different histories that have almost been forgotten um, in Hong Kong, and then to, to re-bring that um, to the audiences um, through this exhibition and through the events here tonight. Um, so yeah, I, I will really like appreciate, and I wanted to leave more time for the artist, and thank you for all um, making all the way here today. And I'm happy to catch up any conversation afterwards. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, and last uh, but not least, um, we have our faculty director, Ken, Ken Pomerantz, is with us tonight, uh, virtually uh, here, um, to speak and moderate the talk. Um, Professor Pomerantz is the faculty director for the University of Chicago campus here in Hong Kong, um, and he's a distinguished university professor of modern Chinese history and the college. Uh, his work focuses mostly on China, and he's also very interested in comparative and world history. Most of his research is on social, economic, environmental history. He's also worked in state formation, imperialism, religion, gender, and many other topics. And I know, Ken, it's really early there. I think it's only 5.06 yeah. in the morning in Chicago. So thank you so much for getting up early to do this program. I'll hand the stage over to you. Ken found this topic extremely interesting himself. And he did a fair amount of research uh, and wrote in the brochure that you should all have by now uh, about his own findings on Zixunnu and the self Kong women. So I'll turn it over to Ken. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there. Um, I was actually about to get on a plane when I tested for positive for COVID. So that didn't work, but I'm glad to be here with you, at least virtually. Um, so traditional Chinese society offered women few alternatives to marriage, but one interesting alternative emerged within the Pearl River Delta, represented by the self-combing women, or Zixunyu, who inspired the art that's on display tonight. The first self-combing women that we know of are from the late Ming. Um, we know that the custom was well established by the early 1800s, and became more common by the early 1900s. Um, around 1930, perhaps 3% of the women in Shundu County, which is now was rural then, but is now part of Foshan City, were Zushunyu. Originally, most of these women had worked in silk production, but by the 1930s, Guangdong silk was in decline, and many non-marrying women were instead moving to cities, whether in Guangdong, in Hong Kong, or overseas. Some of the Zushunyu had been promised to a husband by their families, but rejected the match, which required paying to find a substitute wife for their intended husband. This sometimes also meant breaking relations with the parents who had arranged the marriage. In other cases, though, and probably more common, the women's parents were supportive and received part of the earnings of daughters who remained single. These Zushunu often remained close to their parents and brothers. How, um, the largest group of all of Zushunu, as far as we can tell, announced their intentions before anyone had arranged a marriage for them. They, too, sometimes had parental support and sometimes didn't. Many of these women moved into special houses acquired by communities of self-combing women. Many stayed there their entire lives, and as they aged, they were cared for by a younger Zushunyu, whom they informally adopted. As far as we can tell, the strongest emotional ties that these women formed were with their fellow self-combers, the residents of these houses also paid into collective funds that were used to finance shared rituals and provide insurance for members in case of accident or illness. Other Zushinu, meanwhile, retained very strong ties to their extended natal families, and that, those were their primary relationships. When they got old, they often lived in the home of a married or widowed brother. Why did this emerge in the Pearl River Delta in particular? Well, one unusual feature of this region was that many villages had what were called girls' houses and boys' houses. 
especially in Shundu, unmarried teenagers often lived in a building of five to eight girls or boys. Most of these adolescents eventually made conventional marriages, but you can see how these houses help to legitimize non-marital living arrangements and help to form bonds that sometimes then carried over into the rejection of marriage. Now, we don't know, though, why the Delta had those houses, unlike most of China. But interestingly, some non-Han ethnic groups in southern China, including the Pearl River Delta, had their own traditions of girls and boys' houses. Many of them also gave young people more say in choosing their spouses than traditional Han customs did, including allowing girls to buy their way out of marriages that had been arranged for them. Now, we can't prove that these indigenous practices influence the development of Zushunu, but it seems unlikely that it's pure coincidence. The Pearl River Delta was also, of course, one of the main sources of Chinese emigration. Most emigrants were male, but there were also women, especially in the 20th century, and especially among those going to cities. Some became Zushunu, although they lived quite differently from self-combing women in rural Guangdong. A number of them became factory workers in Hong Kong, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, etc. Notably, larger factories sometimes had workers' dormitories, which could serve as the base for a Zushunu community. But others, probably more, worked in domestic service, often living with their employers. Many of these Zushunu, after years of sending money to their natal families, eventually returned to China, especially after 1949. Still others formed residential communities, much like those that existed in rural Guangdong, sometimes sharing space with Buddhist nuns or other sets of women who, for whatever reason, were outside of marriage. Now, these migrant Zushunu, when they returned home after years of sending money, often had an honored status within their natal family, um, in part because the money that they had sent home had often been very important. Many lived with a brother, though some remained independent. And if the lineage had an ancestral temple, the tablets for these women would eventually have an honored place on its altar. Unlike daughters who had married out, who would then be on the altars of the family that they married into. Sometimes, in fact, these returned Zushunu were more influential than their brothers' wives, partly because of their financial contributions and partly because they, somewhat like their mothers, had strong ties to all the brothers, not just one, and were considered impartial arbiters of disputes. So what does this all add up to? Now, some have seen Zushinu as radicals, rejecting the roles of wife and mother, the tradition assigned them. Others have seen them as self-sacrificing servants of their natal families, sending home important resources, and thus aligned with traditional values. And still others see women who chose their favorite parts of traditional roles, eventually obtaining a status somewhat like that of an elderly mother without ever having been a wife. However we might see an individual case, what is clear is that these women forged pathways that gave them alternatives to mainstream lives and that found a wide variety of expressions that maybe are best understood through the art they inspired. So I'll leave it there and turn it over um, first to Kurt and then to Jalu. Thank you. <laughs> Am I good to go? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, before I start, uh, this is a really intimidating room, by the way. <laughs> and I don't do many public talks, but bear with me if I go go off script. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to uh, Amanda and Arts for Good Foundation for uh, giving me this opportunity, and also, of course, Mark and the University of Chicago uh, for giving the venue to showcase the work. Um, it's a project that's very close to my heart. Um, I will 
uh, talk about it in more in details in a minute. Uh, but it's just, I'm always grateful to tell her story. Um, so a quick introduction about me, very quickly. I'm, I'm, my name's Kurt, Kurt Tong. Uh, I was born in Hong Kong. Uh, I grew up mostly in the UK. Um, and actually, my first degree was in public health. Uh, I was into arts, uh, but I've always been into photography. Um, and during my time in working in India, I fell into being a photojournalist. Uh, and for a few years after that, I was always kind of traveling. I thought I was living the life, uh, telling random stories about random people. <laughs> uh, and then a few things happened. I realized um, I was not prepared for kind of ethical issues about photojournalism. And I wasn't really telling the story. So that's when I kind of went back to university in the UK. I did my master's in documentary photography, which drove me away from traditional photojournalism. Uh, I wanted to tell more long form stories and kind of more personal stories, things I already know about so I can have different ways of telling it. Um, so this is the project that came, I came to this project through another project where I did a project about my granddads. Um, they were interesting people. I'm not here to talk about them today, <laughs> uh, but it, it kind of opened my eye to kind of telling stories through personal
Or, um, she brings a little girl on her back to clean up and then is trying to entertain the brother. And then after the whole day's work, I call home and, and she has to look after her husband. I'm not that dumb. I don't want to look after anyone except, except myself. So that was apparently the case, the point she decided, I don't want to get married. I want to be celibate, um, except she had to look after me, of course. Um, and I see, I'll just kind of jump in this point now. You keep seeing on these magazine pages. Uh, the reason why they're there is if you look at the book, because um, when I was first showcasing the story uh, outside of this region, um, it's something that no one's ever heard of in Europe and America. Uh, and it was very hard for them to kind of place how women were portrayed in different periods of China. Um, so within the magazine, there are kind of women magazine from different decades, from the 1920s, kind of bourgeois Shanghai, um, to 1950s, you see before, where the South Korean women made it into the comic strip. And with the 60s, of course, it's the communist magazine where men and women are treated equally. Um, supposedly, <laughs> um, which is another point I wanted. I'm going to take my glasses off. It's steaming up. <laughs> um, so this work is actually next door now. Uh, it's called Ten Lives. It's another period of because I was when I was making the book, I was treating it every chapter very differently. I didn't want to just use found photographs. I didn't want to just take photographs. So with this work, she was telling me actually during the 1950s in the Great Leap Forward, she actually saved her whole family's life. Uh, so when the famine was raging in China. Um, they were all starving, and she found a loophole where she can smuggle food back into the country through Macau and Zhongshan. She's actually from Zhongshan, not from Shenduk, which is where most of these women came from. Um, so she realized that she can't bring raw food because the border agency didn't want to admit there was a food shortage problem, but you can bring cooked food back. Uh, so every day after her work, she was still working in the previous job then in Wan Chai. Uh, she would go to a different restaurant and collect the burnt rice, the war bar at the bottom of the rice pot, because it was considered cooked food. So she would do that every day for a month. And at the end of each month, she would bring the food back and oil and salt. Um, and another thing she said she did was cloth was also rationed during the time. So she would make like five yards of cloth and make a pair of trousers. So very baggy trousers and also kind of huge cloth bags. She would make four cloth bags, which is uncut with a long piece of cloth and smuggle basically cloth and food back to her family. Um, and we actually, I, we made this uh, rice cake together, me and her, it was a really messy day. Um, and I was photographing it and just looked terrible because it was just burnt rice cakes. Um, and then which point on that day, she mentioned quite a few times about kind of, oh, and this is the point I realized I was appreciated. So her dad said to her <clears throat> in one of her trips, oh, you know, I always thought having daughters was useless, but this year is my daughter to save our lives. Um, so that was kind of very poignant, and I thought I really want to kind of convey that sense. Um, so she actually saved 10 people, and that's why there are 10 circles on here. And what are they? Um, it's actually, I was referencing the fact that, again, the only thing she ever regretted is not being able to read and write her, is her literacy. Uh, so this is actually referencing a no stone tablet rubbing. People who have scholar would like, write textbook on text, and they would do stone rubbing, ink rubbing on to to take the text off. Uh, I figure if she does, she hasn't, she's literate, but this is her language. So this is actually rice cakes with Chinese ink. We took rubbings of the, of the rice cake on the Chinese paper. Um, we're moving forward in time and I revisited my, my, farm, my mother's album and I realized as we got older, it was very clear that she was no longer on the edge. I did some editing here, yeah. but when you go back, when the family album comes, came later in the 80s and early 90s, she was very much part of the photographs. She came on holiday with us. Um, she posed with us. Um, she went on holiday. I think this was in, in, in Penang. Uh, no, she would, be, she would be part of the birthday party as opposed to just in the background serving cakes. Um, me and my brother and sister all got sent away to boarding school, uh, but then my, my mother took up cats <laughs> and we got loads of cats at home. I think she became the nanny to the cats at home. Um, no, she, we always came back. Every time we came home, we would kind of sit with her and we celebrated her birthday. She came to England for my sister's graduation. So it was very much, you can tell just through family album that how she gone from the edge, someone who was definitely outside the family to within the family. Um, and as I was finishing up the project, this is her, I don't want to say replacement, but basically she was getting older and my mom hired a Filipino helper. I thought this would be the end of the project, uh, but because of course I traveled back home with her, I learned about kind of all those years of kind of what she did with the money she earned. Um, and I think a lot of them, I think Ken, um, Ken also mentioned a lot of them did send home back home because the idea is that when you self home, you become financially independent, you keep the money you earn, you don't have no obligation to your families. But that's not the case. A lot of them kept sending money. They were the main breadwinner for the families back in China. So 
she was. I mean, for years and years, all her money went back to her family. She paid for all her brother's marriages, weddings, her nephew and niece's schooling. Um, so I went back home with her again. I went through her nephew's family album. Um, and she keeps appearing. She keeps appearing. She was, I think also Ken mentioned, it's interesting, they became quite powerful. Well, not powerful, kind of respected. Uh, and she was very much respected. She was kind of the queen bee of the Mac tribe back in, back in her village. Uh, at every wedding, she was kind of fun and center. She was the one that everyone wanted to take pictures of. Um, and kind of for my narrative kind of lottery, I guess, uh, one of her nephew, uh, so a lot of them uh, borrowed money in the early 90s to start businesses because they were all from the uh, Tapo Delta River. A lot of businesses was, were kind of being started. Um, and she was kind of a good source of, money a lot of nephews came to her and borrowed money and kind of again for my so i couldn't have asked for better this nep particular nephew started a coat hanger factory in 1991 and now he has 73 factories uh, kind of managed regular different things as multi-millionaire um so it's kind of also really nice kind of using her extended family family archives to tell kind of where her money has gone and how kind of china's boomed in the last 30 years uh, in a very singular personal level um you could tell kind of this is a wedding pictures of, this is the only wedding picture he had of his wedding. And now he has money, he has a marble house and he had this wedding picture retaken. Um, I think he owns like half of this. <laughs> um, but again, she always appeared in the middle uh, because kind of a lot of these photographs weren't very well kept. They were kind of gone moldy. And, um, but because the way she was dressed is always very distinctive. You can always tell who she was, where she is in the photographs. Um, she built also, um, they also mentioned kind of a lot of this uh, women would build a spinster's house. So they would kind of retire together. She never had one, but she built one for her aunt, who was also, also a, a self cone woman. And this is the first factory that he opened. And I put him in a plastic chair. It's a multi-millionaire. I wanted to photograph him in a plastic chair. <laughs> Um, so at the end, to end the book, uh, if you, again, if you go and visit the book, uh, there's kind of tagged in a lot of small booklets because I wanted to really showcase her, um, not through family photographs again, but through kind of her possession and the way she lived. Um, so this is the way she wrote. She never learned to read and write, but she's worked out a system. It's kind of a mixture of Chinese and Arabic numbers. This is how she kept all her phone numbers of everyone she knew. Uh, I photographed every top she owned, um, and there were only about 12. Um, and she wore the same clothes over and over again. She was very, very thrifty. And this particular one, I always want to mention this one. She said she really liked this one. She never wore it. She never really liked this one. And she got it when my grandfather died. She was given some money and she made it kind of one to go to the funeral. My grandfather, at that point, my grandfather has been dead for 37 years. So that was her newest top. Uh, so she wore the same clothes. They really get worn now. She patched them up. Um, and, you know, she would keep elastic band. There was, this was a pillow. Um, this is all clothes. And before you accuse me for not looking after her, <laughs> I did buy her lots of things. Uh, and she would always give it, she would always return the things and give me back the money and say, I don't need it. I don't need it. Don't get me anything. So I learned not to buy her anything. I'll buy her food. I, and actually, I found a way to give her money is I, I would tell her I won these vouchers from the supermarket and I'll give her the vouchers. And that's the only way I can give her money. Um, and Harriet Mugg, when I came back from London one year, she, I asked her what she wanted. And she said, oh, you know that really famous shop with the green bags? <laughs> Can you get me a mug? And she used that for 20 years. Um, this is the only luxury item she had, a pair of jade earrings. It was given to her by the previous employer, Pauline's mom. And I think this is really literally the only thing that showcased she's kind of her showing off. This is her, him, her showing off. Um, this is her toothpaste. She will, um, and by the way, she also, she was quite wealthy. <laughs> um, so, you know, she sent, she, um, my dad helped her look after her money. Um, and I think, cause uh, I think, um, yesterday we had a dry run and someone said, oh, is it because the nephew got rich and she retired? No one ever paid her back and not because they didn't pay her back. She wouldn't want the money back. She rejected all the money being sent back to her, but she was actually independent. She didn't never spend anything. Uh, she invested the money through my dad and she was very kind of comfortable, uh, but she didn't want to retire until she couldn't do it anymore. She was kind of, she felt she was too old. She couldn't go up the steps, uh, slopes anymore. And we invited her to stay. We invited her, you can stay, you know, with us in my, in my family's, my parents' home. And she said, no, she wanted to go move out. She wanted to be by herself. Um, so always kind of really independent in all walks of her lives. Um, this is where she retired. Um, 
And this is how I used to, so the project actually came as an exhibition first. And this is how I ended the exhibition. I wanted, this is her standing in a home village. Um, she definitely built two of those houses in the background, kind of really proud and kind of standing over her hometown. But when I came to make the book, I realized the whole book, um, she had no say. It's always kind of picture of her on the side. It's pictures of her attending weddings, um, kind of places where she worked. I wanted to have her, her to have the final say in the book. Uh, so for the book, I, she did a selfie. This is a selfie. <laughs> um, she chose the background. I was, it was hurting me. I was like, I, I took her to this nice place and a really nice background. She said, no, let's do it here. I like the colors of the wall. It's like, it's going to look bad in my book. Um, but this is her. She's all her decisions. She chose this wall and this is a selfie. And this is me and her. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I just really, um, I always say this project really is a love note to her. Um, I never really expect anyone to be interested. Um, I just wanted to spend time with her, uh, but I've been quite lucky with the work and kind of how it's disseminated and people's taking an interest. Um, so just to very briefly talk about the exhibition next door. Uh, so this is actually, I did the frame with the her eight passport photograph first. That was the first work. Uh, this is the second work as the pictures of where she was on the edge. Uh, as you can see, the way what I did is I actually used her possession to cover my brother and sisters up. Um, so she's still on the edge, but now we have been covered up. So I've reworked the family album to be just about her. It's not about me and my brother and sisters anymore. It's about her. Um, and another funny story is I had a show in Shanghai once and it was a very big museum room and it was so much space in the middle and I had a bright idea that since the nephew never paid her back, she so he borrowed 10,000 yuan in 1991 and he never paid her back, she didn't want it. Uh, so I WeChatted him and said, oh, can you send me $10,000 worth of coat hangers? And he did, he shipped it to me as a way to pay her back, as kind of showcase, the thank, uh, kind of like a thank to her. Uh, so we plonked 20,000 coat hangers in the middle of the museum. I tried to do that here, but uh, you said no. <laughs> Um, and then uh, when after the ex exhibition came out, uh, the book is kind of much more comprehensive, telling each kind of different parts of the story. Um, and that's pretty much it. And I want to just wrap up the final point is when the book came out and then the exhibition came out, a lot of people kind of said to me, well, how much of it did you make up? Her life is so perfect. Um, I didn't make any up. Maybe she did. <laughs> I really listened to her as her narrative of her life, but I just, it was very truthful to how she wanted to portray her life. And I was very glad to have the opportunity to work with her to tell her story. Um, and I, I hope she represents a certain sector of Southcom women at least. Uh, and I always say, well, before I pass it on to you, <laughs> um, people always, when the project came out, a lot of people kind of, they expected me to be the expert of Southcom women. And I always say, I only knew one. I did, so I think <laughs> Jia Yu knows a lot more than me about kind of the more history side. And she also made great work about, about in response to Southcom women. So I'll pass on this clicker to you. <laughs> and I, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm Jalu. And my project's beginning is very different from Kurt because at the beginning, I didn't know any one of Southcom women. I, I think it's just, uh, it came from an urban ghost story in Hong Kong that is, there have seven girls and they are in sisterhood and, and swear not to get married together. But at the end, uh, one of the sisters' family has arranged a marriage for her, and then this these seven girls decide to jump in the sea together in in Hong Kong uh, at at the beach in Bangkok, and then and then after that, the villagers found out there were seven big rocks on the beach, and then after after they jump off the sea, and then. There's a lot of urban ghost story comes up in that beach, but that beach is now it's it's all covered by the government to build the new city. So um, start from their stories and then uh, combine with the, some TV dramas I I watched in my childhood, like uh, Mui that TVB has have filmed, but. At the end, is that that is a love story, so it's not very about the Martin. So I start to research on the history of this group of women, and to find out who they are and how they live, and and to see if their lives, it's it's somehow is same as I imagine, or is different than my imagine. 
So I start to search on the the group oak, uh, which is uh, the group oak is the buildings and the houses they built for them to live together because they are all self combo women. So they are not allowed to live in their original family. So they have to uh, save some money for themselves and then work in the film or in the factory to to build their own house for them to live in. Or when they are died, they can put their tablets in the building as well. Um, so uh, there's this four building now is um, no one use anymore. Uh, you can see the the right upper side, the the Beng Yok Tong in Shunde, which is the most famous uh, Gu Po Ok, which is uh, uh, this building is built by many uh, Ma Zhe, which retired from Singapore, and then they come back to their hometown to build this uh, big house in Shunde. And then they, at that time, they lived in this house, but at the end, they all moved out with their families. And now this house, they have their templates and several gods they memorize. Also, the other Maze from uh, different cities, like in Dongguan or in Zhongshan, uh, other cities in Guangdong. And uh, on the left side, these two houses is now, I think it's, they are kind of uh, abandoned or they are just not well protected because uh, no people can use it anymore. And then the government, it's the government, uh, they do not have enough money or they do, do not have enough knowledge to protect it. And the, the left downside, this house is in Zhaoqing, which is, uh, in, in some point is the first Gupo Ok in Guangdong. And it's actually a temple of Gunyam and before uh, this house has a lot of documents or materials that the self come women left in the house. But uh, many years ago, this house was robbed and all the materials are gone. And in, in this picture, there are two houses and there are two houses still using by people. And the upper one is in Hong Kong, in Nam Chong. And and this house is still keeping by the uh, extant families of uh, self come women, uh, which is this house is built by, by one self come woman, which is the villagers in Nam Chong. And she built the house and then she also accepts the other self come women in the nearby village to live in their house. And this house now it's used by several young men to organize their art activities or some spiritual activities. Because in, in, in that time, the self come women in this house, they also can do some spiritual reading or some medical treatment for the villagers. And the, and the, uh, downside in the, this house in Si Chao is also uh, it's like a vegetarian hall in, in Foshan. And the, there are two parts of this house. Uh, one part is rebuilt and the another part it's like you can see in the picture it's, it's very old and not well protected. So they are still collecting money to rebuild this house. And this woman uh, who is looking for the, the house in the Si Chao and she's also a woman who decided not to get married, but uh, she did not accept uh, such ceremony like the other self come women do, because uh, at that time the self come women they have a special uh, ceremony, just like the traditional marriage ceremony that they can.
to show the existence of this Salkam woman. And this photo is given by, a da by David. Uh, his family also hired like two or three Salkam women to look after their children. And this lady called Muize, who is moved to the Singapore with his little brother. And, and when I went to his house, because when I went to uh, Penang, he is the host of my accommodation. And then I talked about my project and, and then he said, oh, I had a self-come woman, which is he, he called this woman uh, Ama Black and White. Then I know the people in Malaysia, they call this group of women Black and White. And then he asked his family to give a photo of this woman called Muize, which is work in his little brother's home and then uh, in, in Singapore. Uh, this, this lady also in the video of this exhibition, it's called Guan Lai Bo. Uh, she's born in Punyu in Guangdong, and, but he, she never had a chance to go out to Hong Kong or go to South Asia because during the war, uh, she can't go out. So she farmed for many years and then she went to Guangzhou, a handbag factory and worked there for uh, 12 years and then come back to hometown. Now uh, she lived alone upon the land of, his, of her little brother because in a traditional village in Guangdong, uh, daughters can't can't receive the land from the family or from the village because the family or the village only gave the land or the property to the sons. So she has to build a house for, for herself with 2,000 yuan and then on his little brother's land and now live alone in Panyu. And in her village, because the government decide to collect the land to build a university city. So uh, her, her great aunt, also, who is also a South Kong sister, and she went to Hong Kong and then back to the hometown to buy a land and build a Gupo Oak in Punyu. But in 2010, the, the government decided to build the university city. So the, the Gupo Oak was demolished which is also like the many other Gupo in Guangdong. Uh, they are all demolished and, and this Gupo, like uh, Guan Lai Bo, she didn't know anything when they demolished the house. So uh, she's a bit upset and depressed because she said uh, if she died, she don't have any place to go. And this also... Uh, reminds me like many other uh, self-come women in Guangdong because there's, they, they saw really important their, where, where they can go when they died. And this is other, a very interesting story, but it's not very related to the uh, self-come women, but uh, I think it's... Um, related to the immigrants in South Asia or related to the people who are far away from home. Because this lady I, I met in a Dong An Wuigun, which is, she, she's born in Malaysia, but her, her elder brother and her second brother, they were in the Dong Guan. And then she, she only went to Dongguan once, like 30 years ago. So she, she met her elder brother just once and also her nephew. And when I went to that Wagon the next day, she gave me two letters and asked me to pass these two letters when I back to Dongguan and hope me, I hope I can find her families in Dongguan. Then she can reconnect their families. We've run a, 
a bit long, so we won't have too much time, but I think a couple of the questions that have come in through Q&A can maybe be combined into a sort of macro question, which is, what do you think it is about the stories of these women that speaks to speaks to people outside this world, um, particularly in a moment when, at least in theory, other alternatives to marriage exist now that didn't exist before. Um, so what is it about this particular form of of opting out of marriage that you think speaks to speaks to us now and speaks to us beyond these particular places? And I guess maybe if all if all three of you, including Amanda, want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I think that initially the one thing I want to say respond to that first is uh, when the the video came out. Um, the ETL video that's on screen now, um, and it went kind of slightly viral in China. Uh, one of the kind of overwhelming common in in, in the comment section was, uh, "Well, I look at them; they had that choice. That was so many years ago. I wish I can choose non-marriage, and my parents let me get away with it." So I think even though like the modern times come and there are so many choices, there's still a pressure. I mean, especially within this context of in China, that kind of pressure from parents to get married at a certain age, and then you can left over women if you're not married by a certain age, you're left over. I think they almost kind of look up to the fact that say, 70, 200 years ago they had the option to opt out, and now that's gone. Uh, and kind of secondly, kind of how it connects to a, to a wider group. I think when I had a show um, a few years ago in, in Ao and it was an international photo festival, a lot of people kind of sent me emails and spoke to me afterwards, but they, they were kind of from all over the world, but they had the same experience with kind of caregiver. Uh, I think that happens in a lot of cultures. We have like women take on the role of caregivers beyond the mothers. They're not related, but they take over the role of kind of the main caregiver, the mother figure. And I think that rings true in a lot of cultures as well. So, um, beside, I mean, I know it's not related to kind of Southcom women, but I think it's just kind of being celebrating the role of these women has taken, um, and it's kind of speak to a lot of other people beyond this region as well. That's that's my take. Um, thank you. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the question, Ken. I think for me, um, I didn't talk about inspiration before this uh, event because I want everybody to listen to their story first. When I met Kurt, I know the story for many years. I didn't really think about it to make an exhibition until I met Jia Lu. I, I, it makes me feel like um, this is what the Hong Kong is, the immigration culture. And also when I thought about um, the story of um, Ma Zhe, I always want to bring more of um, um, the context. What is the, the life that they've been facing back in their own home village? How do we inspire our new generations, you know, in a different context. I think this is what the story is about um, um, to, to, um, to our modern world and um, really talking about the perspective choices in different contexts and, um, yeah. I also heard a lot of friends who is also thinking about the topic about, about marriage or the topic about sisterhood or or what is woman, they feel really surprised to find out there's such a marriage custom or marriage pattern in Guangdong. But I think it's also um, a topic for us to think about what is tradition, because I think many people thought uh, married is also is a tradition, but I think unmarried is also kind of tradition. So I think it's we can think about or get inspiration or the encouragement to think about um, what we have forgotten or what have been disappeared in our modern life and what we can do now. While we wait for another question, I just to pick up on that last point, I think it's also an opportunity to think about what does, what does mainstream mean? Right. I mean, we tend to think that mainstream, as Jalu just said, means marriage, and these other things are marginal. But when you think about sort of who the culture celebrates, 
It's often more complicated than that. I mean, think of the figure of Guan Yin, right, who is the patron deity of many of these women. Um, and she's a figure whom the marginal look up to, but in another way, you can't be any more mainstream in Chinese culture than Guan Yin, right? And Guan Yin herself, at least in the Miao Shan story, right, is a marriage resistor who has this horrible battle with her father over marriage resistance, and then reconciles with him and wounds up being celebrated because, among other things, she saves his lineage, right? So there are these complicated ways in which people move back and forth and combine roles that seem incompatible. And I think the woman who in some ways winds up, as I said in my talk, as a kind of symbolic mother without ever having been a wife is a kind of perfect example of that, right? How culture allows you to do what biology says you can't. And there was another question that came in um, on my phone for Amanda about, okay. um, do you have any knowledge about other exhibitions that have taken place in Hong Kong like this? Um, and, you know, how is this exhibition different from whatever you have known about before? Um, I think when I met Kurt many, many years ago, I always thought about, well, why don't we have more exhibitions about the people who has been forgotten, have been neglected in, in Hong Kong? I hope to bring more uh, of that stories, uh, definitely. Um, um, Ma Jie has been in, the, is a Chinese Cultural Heritage Museum in Singapore. It's a permanent exhibition in, in Singapore. And there's a children's book about it. Um, I think I was just talking to one of the audiences. It's a universal value of love um, for for um, for generations growing up in in the Southeast Asian culture, um, I don't know. If that's a question. <laughs> I hope so. Um, I, I, yeah. Okay, Ken. Any other questions from you? Um, I guess one of the things I wanted to ask about, since both of you work a lot in photography, um, what it was you thought about that particular medium as a way of capturing these lives. I mean, there are, you know, there are lots of other things you could have done. Um, and of course, it's not the only thing you do. But for both of you, photography is really central. Um, and I was wondering sort of what you think are its strengths and weaknesses for capturing these stories. I think uh, photography is the quickest way to record things because I think during the research, the, the immediate things you can do is take photos or take notes because people's memories, they've gone so fast. So you, what you need to do or you have to do is take photos and re remember the moments then you can do the other things when you back to your computer or you back to the studio. And then I think that's what photography can, can do in that moment. Um, I have a complete opposite take on photography is a really rubbish medium <laughs> uh, to capture something, but precisely because it's bad. Um, because with photography, it's not like a film. You have a beginning and an end. You're thrown right into the middle. You have no context of what happened before, what happened, what's going to happen afterwards. But that's precisely how, why I love it, because you sh actually show very little in photographs. You don't know, really know the context, but that allows the viewers to fill in all the blanks. And that's kind of, I think that's the way I like to work. It's, there are so many blanks and, and, and people can then project their own experience. I think even tonight I spoke to someone who talked about um, his, his, his nanny. And I think if, if I give too much information, it's about just me and my nanny, but the way it is now, it's plenty of room for other people to project their own experience. And that's why I like it. But yeah, I think you did a great job um, using photography to show perspectives and relationships. 
Um, that was really well done in the work that you did, Kurt. Um, I should just offer, Ken, a couple folks in the uh, audience, maybe they'd like to ask one or two questions. Is there anybody? Yes, here. Yes. Uh, in your research, Jeru, did you ever come across uh, any religion uh, other than Kunin, as we mentioned, uh, Taoist, Taoist deities like, uh, uh, because this morning I took my friends to do some research at South K1. There's a group house still there, which was uh, established during the Manchu dynasty and the government could not uh, uh, take over the land. And there's a, still a very big house supposed to be the residence of this uh, Maje uh, many, many years ago. It's a mysterious place. We could not enter that house to do some further research. Uh, maybe all this uh, Maje passed away and that was uh, uh, taken over by some other uh, people connected with this Taoist uh, association. But we learned this uh, so-called get locked down, this extreme happiness uh, case, literally translated in English, was uh, also carried to Southeast Asia. So many of these uh, Maje in Southeast Asia also believe in this Taoist uh, religion. So I wonder whether you have ever come across any stories in your research. I did found a lot of uh, Maja's house at the end become a temple or become a vegetarian hall or a zai tong like the like the geklot tong you said. I think uh, become a place of religion that is a, a important way to save their house because religion can give people a way to keep the house because people don't really destroy the temple easily or they think the religion has the energy or power to bond or attract people to use the house. I think it, I mean, not so much about religion, just, I mean, the, I visited quite a few, uh, Spencer's coupon book as well when I was shooting the project and they all sit there and make the Joss paper nuggets, right? The, yeah, 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 so I think it's definitely, and then you mentioned many times how when they die, they're so concerned about the, the tablets, uh, and which also ring true with Ante, because um, she's, I mean, she, she's the only one that looked after my grandfather's uh, altar. Uh, she was, she took, I think it's just a, maybe they're from the countryside, they're very much dedicated to Dogao. The, you know, she was worshipping the Deiju Gong, also she was doing all the Taoist kind of rituals anyway, and she was really concerned about, she wanted to be buried, she wanted to, a grave so people, people can go to. Um, the last time the Hong Kong government gave us money, which is like 15 years ago, uh, she bought a plaque in one of the, the home, the, the halls. Uh, so I think that's that really rings true with the group. They want to have a place where the, because I think with, because they're not married, they believe they don't have a, a place to go in the afterlife. So they have to have a plaque so they can always revisit there. So I think guess that's extension of Taoism into their everyday life. Great, thank you. Any other questions on this side of the room? We'll take one more question. We're running a little long. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. We want to give you a little bit of time to go back and look at the exhibition, but I want to thank Kurt and Jalu and Ken and Amanda for this amazing program. Thank you very much. Kurt, Kurt and Jalu, you can return to your seats and I'll close out the program. Actually, we had uh, an audience that hung in this whole time, which was quite amazing. And, uh, but it was such a compelling program. Um, I did want to just mention that um, I kind of skipped over the fact that Arts for Good Foundation is really trying to address some of the polarizing social issues and cultural divisions here in Hong Kong. And it's one of the reasons that really motivated me to want to work with Amanda and her team to provide more equal access to the arts uh, here in Hong Kong. So thanks, Amanda, for putting this together. Um, yeah, thank you. 
And uh, I was inspired and I learned so much from this project. We still have a long way to go. Um, but I, you know, I do want to thank everybody for the participation tonight. Um, the exhibition will remain open until about 8.45 if you want to go back in. For those folks who are on Zoom, I just, and for the people here tonight, um, I just wanted to close by saying uh, you can check out our podcast, uh, the course. Um, it's on Apple and Spotify and Simalaya in mainland. Um, and we're resuming after 100 episodes uh, in season one, we're resuming with season two with our professor, Peter Littlewood, the chair of our physics department at the University of Chicago. So uh, please check out the podcast. Um, our heritage site still has uh, the tram exhibition, uh, 100 year, 20 year anniversary of the Hong Kong tramways. Uh, Ken will be back in Hong Kong within the next 10 to 14 days. And we're gonna reschedule the program that we had to cancel on uh, Tuesday night. Uh, where he'll talk about the research he did on the tramways exhibition, which should be really fascinating. And then, of course, um, the for the people who are on Zoom who haven't seen the exhibition yet, the Daughters of Canton Delta exhibition is available, and you can sign up on our website at www.uchicago.hk. Thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.